Good afternoon. I'm Shanta Trevetti. I'm an assistant professor of law here and the faculty director of the Sarah Neil Meyerhoff Center for Families, Children, and the Courts. I'm thrilled to welcome you to this afternoon's webinar, which looks at the Indian Child Welfare Act, or ICWA. Congress enacted ICWA in 1978 in response to a long and tragic history of separating Native American children from their families. Today, even with ICWA's protections in place, Native children continue to be overrepresented in foster care. ICWA's proponents remind us that ICWA is the gold standard in child welfare, as it requires heightened protection for families and keeps children with their relatives or in their community if a court determines that removal is necessary. Opponents of the law say it exceeds Congress's power, violates states' rights, and imposes unconstitutional race-based classifications. Over the next hour, our panelists will share their thoughts on these issues. First, my colleague, Kimberly Whaley, who joined the faculty at the University of Baltimore School of Law in 2009. She teaches courses in federal courts, administrative law, and civil procedure. Professor Whaley is a frequent legal analyst on network radio and television. She's the author of multiple books about constitutional law and lawyering, and she often contributes opinion pieces to several publications, including The Atlantic, The Hill, and The Bulwark, to name a few. She has written about the Raheem case for Politico, among other publications. Next, we have April Olson, who is a partner at the law firm of Rothstein Donatelli in Tempe, Arizona. Ms. Olson has served tribal governments for almost 20 years, first as a social worker and then as an attorney. Ms. Olson graduated law school with a certificate in Indian law. She then served the community in several capacities, including as a prosecutor and as assistant general counsel before entering private practice. At her firm, Ms. Olson exclusively practices in the field of Indian law and has represented nine tribes in ICWA matters in over 10 states across the country at both the trial court and appellate levels. And this week I've seen firsthand how busy she is at all of these trials, multiple trials going on at the same time. Uh, next, we have Neosha Romer, who is an assistant professor at the University of Idaho College of Law, where she teaches family law, Native American law, and family relations in Indian law. Prior to teaching at Idaho, Professor Romer works at the fellow and worked at, as the fellow and later staff attorney for the Indigenous Law and Policy Center at the Michigan State University College of Law. She also graduated law school with a certificate in Indian law. And while Professor Romer has done extensive work with various Native American tribes, she is not herself a member. Unfortunately, April UP role and associate Munger Tolson Olson, who is an expert in Indian law and enrolled member of the Assiniboine, Boyne, excuse me, Assiniboine and Sioux tribes of the Fort Peck Indian Reservation, was unable to join us due to illness. We hope that she's better soon, and we're very sorry that she can't join us. I will serve as moderator for the discussion, and we're really looking forward to your questions, which you can submit using the Q&A function on your Zoom dashboard. We'll get to as many of them as we can, and I want to thank you all, our guests, for joining, and thank you to our panelists. So let's begin. So Neosh, I'm going to start with you. What is ICWA, and why was it enacted? Sorry about that. Um, so ICWA is the Indian Child Welfare Act, um, and I think it actually works a little bit better if I just sort of explain uh, what it is briefly and then give the um, historical reasons behind it. Um, but the Indian Child Welfare Act applies to Indian children, uh, tracks with Indian children, as defined by the statute, who are at the center of certain types of child custody proceedings. So that's the basic what ICWA does. Um, why ICWA exists is a pretty complicated story um, that I think is currently at the heart of Holland versus Brad Keen. Um, you know, a lot of folks have heard or encountered narratives, um, the history of colonization, but one of the things that we rarely focus on is that the story of colonization, particularly how um, American settlers indigenous or colonized indigenous communities in the U.S., is really one of the family and particular attacking the family and, and targeting children as tools of assimilation. Um, what I mean by that, <clears throat> the federal government since um, the 19th century, and I hate saying the 19th century because then sometimes people are like, that was a long time ago, but relatively speaking, it's not a long time ago. Um, by the mid-19th century, the federal government itself implemented a series of policies um, that um, encouraged, and I put encouraged in quotes, but encouraged Indian parents to send their children to boarding schools. Many times these boarding schools were off-reservation, 
um, pretty far away. And as you can imagine, in the 19th century, um, travel wasn't easy. Um, but why I said encouraged in quotation marks um, is because what we're talking about was, yes, um, parents needed to consent to send their children to these boarding schools. But oftentimes that consent looked like if you don't consent to send your children, if this tribe doesn't send its children uh, to boarding school to get educated, you won't have your rations. Um, so essentially, send your kids to boarding school or go hungry. Um, and now some parents did also voluntarily send their children to boarding schools for education. Um, but what we found was these boarding schools were actually started and implemented by people who used the military school model. Um, so meaning that children rarely got education in the sense that we, we think of education today. Um, we're talking about little boys being taught to farm, to do industrial work, to farm, um, and little girls being taught to be homemakers. Um, these schools were centers of a lot of abuse, um, particularly physically, physical abuse, mental abuse, sexual abuse, um, because children were essentially there to become assimilated. Um, and what I mean by assimilation is lose your indigenous culture, to lose their indigenous culture. Um, so if they did not speak English, if they spoke their own language, they were punished physically. Um, if children spoke to other siblings and family members, they were punished. The whole idea was to make these Indian children <clears throat> more anglicized, if you will, more Western. In doing so, the purpose behind this policy was that if we assimilate children and children just, the Indian children just join society, um, at some level we can stop treating Indian tribes as sovereign nations. Um, because the United States government has a special, this is what we call a special trust responsibility that it owes to Indian tribes, which predate the US Constitution. Um, and so in doing so, the government's goal here was assimilate children, therefore there are no Indians, therefore we can terminate these tribes. We don't have to maintain that relationship. And also it opens up lands, um, which is something that, you know, you've, if you've been following any coverage on Helen versus Brad Keen, there are several theories about land and why land is important in this case. <clears throat> so from about the mid 19th century until the 1960s, which is like I said, this really wasn't that long ago, um, the US government supported this boarding school policy. But something changed in the 1940s, um, in that post-World War II era. If you're familiar at all with the baby boom, um, that also encapsulated this adoption culture, uh, primarily because middle-class families needed children. They needed children to adopt, to raise. Um, Indian children uh, became um, somewhat, I, I feel somewhat confident in saying, became sort of the center of that adoption era because the United, the Sorry, the government started the Indian Adoption Project in the 1940s. Through this project, the government supported policies in which Indian parents place their children for adoption. Again, um, I'm using this more neutral language, but one of the things, one of the phenomena that we saw in the legislative history behind ICWA demonstrates that this was not always voluntary. Um, to the point, um, one story that I like to recount in these types of settings, <clears throat> a young woman having a state welfare worker coming to her house on the reservation, banging on the door, threatening her, give me your child, give me your child. Um, you're not, you're not capable of raising this child for the sole reason that she was Indian and living on the reservation. This is in the legislative history. Um, so we saw these policies utilized to adopt Indian children out of their communities. <clears throat> and uh, there were other issues too, in terms of the role of state government agencies, state child welfare workers, and also nonprofit organizations that were um, aiding in terminating these parents' rights, uh, sometimes through trickery, sometimes through fraud. Um, and what I mean by that is simply handing parents a piece of paper and saying, sign it. Um, and then the parents later finding out they'd actually signed over their rights and placed the child for adoption. So there were a lot of underhanded tactics being utilized at the time. Um, but again, a uh, similar theory applied to Indian adoption as to the boarding schools. We need to assimilate Indian children. We need to make sure these children are 
um, becoming American, because if they become American, then they can get off the reservation. Then we don't have to deal with these tribes because there won't be any people. Um, it was the same theory. Um, so by the mid 1970s, when Congress is hearing testimony, um, because by the 1970s, there's a whole generation of civil rights lawyers and advocates um, out working in the um, <clears throat> out working with people, seeing what's happening with parents, um, seeing that a lot of these parents have no sort of due process at all. Um, child protective petitions filed against parents who have no due process, no opportunity to be heard. Um, and, you know, raising the flag of something's not right. So several grassroots um, or civil rights organizations, including the American Association on Indian Affairs, um, raised the alarm bell. So by the mid-1970s, Congress is hearing testimony. And during that testimony, um, what we learned was approximately 25 to 35% of all Indian children had been removed from their homes at that time, with 90% of those children, not only being placed away from family, but completely outside of their community. So we're talking about a history of community devastation with the end goal or the aim of getting rid of Indian tribes. Um, so not by the physical, um, not by a physical act of genocide, but a cultural genocide to um, remove Indians um, and again, open lands, there's all these different things. So when I say this is the story of colonization, this is the part we don't talk about in terms of how families, um, because yes, there's a government piece, uh, because this government, gov government to government relationship exists between the US government and Indian tribes. And by the way, there's 574 Indian tribes. So each of those tribes has a unique relationship with the federal government. Um, but in trying to get rid of that, to break that, uh, that trust responsibility, that special relationship, families became targeted. Um, so we saw the breakup of Indian families. So that's the lead up to ICWA. Um, and if I may, I can I can go ahead and, and lead into what it does today. Sure. Do you want to tell us? Okay. I know there's been sure. a lot of talk about placement preferences, and the placement preferences are really at the heart of the litigation. So if you could explain to us what those are, I think that'd be really helpful. Sure. So ICWA does a variety of things, and I um break this up into two major parts which is ICWA prevents the breakup of the Indian family um, by providing heightened standards uh, state courts need to meet in certain types of child custody proceedings uh, involving Indian children and it also promotes tribal sovereignty so the placement preferences um, is actually why ICWA is considered a gold standard among child welfare workers um, because if a child needs to be removed from their home uh, in, in the foster care uh, scenario. <clears throat> so let's say there's a, an abuse and neglect proceeding and a child needs to be removed from their home. ICWA has a set of placement preferences that says, here's how we should place this child. And, and um, it starts with extended family. And from extended family, if we can't find a placement there, we go into other tribal members um, and then so on and so forth as prescribed by the statute. But the important piece is that the tribe um, is able to participate. And that's one of the things that ICWA provides for is tribal participation in these child welfare proceedings. Um, additionally, I mentioned the heightened standards. Before we ever even get to removal, um, ICWA requires the testimony um, or actually requires findings, right, that this is um, to prevent physical and emotional harm before terminating a parent's rights. ICWA provides heightened stand or excuse me heightened fine sorry heightened um, standards with findings that include things like um, a qualified expert witness who is someone who ideally should be of that child's tribe but they must by statute be familiar with the cultural upbringing um, cultural um, child rearing practices of that tribe and must be able to testify whether or not this child faces the threat of serious physical or emotional harm uh, if they were to remain in this relationship with their parents, this legal relationship. Um, it also provides that the state should provide active efforts to reunify the family uh, before this drastic solution of the termination of parental rights takes place. Um, because one sort of conversation that happens a lot in child welfare circles um, is sort of the termination of parental rights being a more modern standard, but also one that's very Western. 
um, which is very true in these types of um, in these types of cases as well. Um, and so with that, I will go ahead and uh, cede the floor and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, I know a lot of that history and still listening to it in that way is really hard to hear. So thank you for summarizing it for us so beautifully. Um, Kim, I want to talk about the case itself, right? The Brackeen case. Who are these petitioners? I sort of gave a brief overview of who they are, but who are they? And why do they believe that ICWA is constitutional, unconstitutional, excuse me? Um, thank you very much. And thanks for having me. It's uh, interesting personally that when I was in law school, uh, my first summer, I worked in California at a place called California Indian Legal Services. And we did both local social services work as well as impact litigation. And uh, one of the clients was um, an incarcerated individual who wanted to use eagle feathers and have long hair consistent with his First Amendment rights. And that produced my law review note in law school. So for a lot of reasons, it's a really interesting and I appreciate being here. So as, as was so eloquently laid out, um, this is a statute that was designed to, to remedy system-wide um, violence to Native American families, Indian families. Um, there, there are two sets of plaintiffs. One set, um, as Shanta mentioned, are states, uh, and the other is one family in particular who had gone through the ICBA process. I believe it was a Caucasian family and adopted one child successfully and seeks to adopt another child uh, from um, the native population uh, into their family and is claiming that ICWA is an impediment to that. So there's a lot going on here, you know, from a matter of sort of broader separation of powers principles. Uh, and I'll just put a pin in one, which is the question of Article Three standing to bring this lawsuit. This is a issue that's going across a number of cases before the current United States Supreme Court. Um, you know, Justice Scalia, sort of a conservative icon, was instrumental in erecting a pretty stringent test for getting before federal courts. The idea being you have to identify immediate harm to yourself in order to get uh, federal jurisdiction. Here you have potential harm because they're claiming maybe I won't be able, it'll be harder for me. Easily the court could have gotten rid of that case on standing grounds. And likewise, the 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 question of states suing the federal government. I'm here, this, this happened with the Biden immigration case as well. Um, and the argument is essentially that it's costing them money um, to to have to comply with ICWA. And so if, if we're now going to be in a world where states can say, I have some financial harm by virtue of what the federal government is doing, we're going to see the states become sort of, you know, super, super oversight of federal programs because they can always claim some kind of financial impact um, for individuals, the court from for you know decades has now said the fact that you have tax, they're a taxpayer is not enough to get into court. So that's an aside on a, a, a bigger level. As far as I mean, this is an assault straight up at the heart, not just of ICWA, um, but of tribal sovereignty and Congress's power under what's known as the Indian Commerce Clause. So the Commerce Clause gives Congress lots of power to, to legislate. It's been broadly interpreted. A special part of that relates to Indian tribes in particular. Um, and so that's the theory under which ICWA was implemented. And as I'll just quote Justice Gorsuch, um, or I'll paraphrase Justice Gorsuch, who's quite, you know uh, a real champion of Indian rights, um, said, it said in 200 years, the Supreme Court has never struck down laws based on the exercise of Congress's plenary power to regulate Indian in affair, Indian affairs. So that's why this is such a really aggressive legal legal maneuver here by these plaintiffs. Three major arguments, and then one sort of smaller argument. Uh, the first is that that essentially and again we're seeing this in other places we we're seeing this was 303 creative in the first amendment um relating to you know lgbtq rights and the first amendment that clash they're arguing that essentially ICWA creates a racial classification that um decisions are mandated under uh, ICWA based on race on the race of children and the race of families that gets strict scrutiny under the equal protection clause and it violates the equal protection clause they go on to say, 
um, you know, there's not a compelling state interest for this. And in fact, there's not even, they, they go so far as to argue, there's not an irrational basis for this because they are construing the Indian Commerce Clause as narrow. Um, as I said, it's been construed as plenary. It's never really been questioned on this idea that tribes are sovereigns. Um, you know, the, his, the sordid history, we can debate whether there was they gave up sovereignty willingly or they were forced to give up sovereignty, but they're almost treated under American law as if they were, you know, a separate foreign country with some, of course, some, some distinctions there. But the idea is it's a very special entity under American law. And the argument here is, um, the scope of the Commerce Clause, the Indus Commerce Clause, does not go to, to family law matters. It's only as to Indian self-government, tribal government, the tribal polity. And because this has nothing to do with tribal sovereignty per se, I know there are arguments on the other side that my colleagues on the panel could articulate, because there's no, this is not about tribal sovereignty, it exceeds the Congress's power under um, the Indian Commerce Clause to even pass ICWA. And it violates um, it violates uh, equal protection as a because it's a racial classification. So equal protection number one, as I said, number two is exceeds Congress's power um, to regulate Indian and affairs. Are arguing a narrower construction of the Indian Commerce Clause, and then they make a Tenth Amendment federalism argument, and they say, listen, under state law. Um, the it's the best interest of the child standard. And here, what ICWA is doing is saying, sidestep the best interest of the child. What is what is mandatory is uh, tribal integrity under the criteria set forth in the ICWA. And that that is essentially foisting on the states, um, forcing them unconstitutionally to do what the federal government says over an area that is traditionally left exclusively to state, um, you know, the state prerogative. Now, I know we're going to get into oral argument, but Justice Sotomayor pushed back on that concept and said, there's plenty of times where the federal government has superseded state family law, um, for example, with the Hague Convention on the Civil Aspects of International Child Abduction. So that's, that is an overwrought argument she makes, and, and you know, we can get into this in more detail. The last argument they make as was mentioned, one of the, um, I think, celebrated aspects or better aspects um, from on the ground for ICWA is that the tribes actually participate in this process. The other argument that Texas makes in particular is that that's an unconstitutional delegation of authority to a tribe. That is, that Congress cannot give tribes that um, authority uh, to make those determinations pursuant to federal law, absent in an intelligible principle. This, this kind of gets into this non-delegation doctrine that is also floating around when it comes to federal agencies. The idea that, okay, if, if the power is lodged in Congress under Article One, only Congress can, can exercise that power. Congress can't give even a modicum of that power to, to, to the uh, tribal government. So um, various pieces going on, as I said, from a separation of power standpoint, the question is, okay, how, what is Congress's power? So if, if this case were to be successful uh, on the, from the petitioner standpoint, this is a real swipe at the authority of the United States Congress to pass a statute like this pursuant, pursuant to the um, Indian uh, Commerce Clause. It's also, of course, a, a swipe at sovereign, um, at state, uh, excuse me, tribal sovereignty. Um, and, you know, it's kind of a hydraulic discussion whenever we get into separation of powers. The ultimate question then is who wins the, the power play here? Um, on the one hand, it could be states. And then on the other hand, as we're seeing across the board, uh, I think with this Supreme Court, it is ultimately the Supreme Court that becomes uh, the, 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 you know, the, the top dog when it comes to making these kinds of determinations, notwithstanding express authority in the Constitution under Article One that Congress can make this determination. Wow, thank you, Kim. Um, those are, first of all, the, those are such complicated arguments. The, the arguments in this case are so complicated. So thank you for breaking them down in such a clear way in five minutes, um, because I know uh, these are seriously uh, intricate arguments that and creative arguments, a lot of them that the petitioners have put together. I wanna drill down on the equal protection argument. And 
April, you know, Kim just articulated how the allegations is that this is an impermissible racial classification. What's the response to that uh, from the respondents? And why is the distinction that they draw so important? Um, well, thank you. I, I'd like to start by giving just a little bit of background on history on why we got here and then touch on what I think is a really important part of the equal protection argument, which is the standing. Um, and then I think Professor, Professor Romer is going to further elaborate on why this equal protection argument um, you know, strays so far from longstanding precedent that we've seen from the Supreme Court. Um, and I also just want to let everybody know that um, I'm not a professor, I'm a practitioner. So I sort of approach this subject from the lens of a practitioner. Um, I have represented tribes in state court proceedings and litigated cases in state court for many, many years. Um, and as has been stated, ICWA has been in existence for almost 45 years now, since 1978. And until you know, several years ago, ICWA was a relatively quiet topic. Um, and, you know, issues that were litigated in state court were issues like whether the tribe had notice of an involuntary proceeding, or whether there was good cause to deviate from the ICWA pl placement preferences or good cause to deny a transfer. Um, it wasn't until at least in Arizona, uh, about 2014, when the Goldwater Institute circulated a letter uh, seeking foster or adoptive parents uh, who were unable to adopt or foster an Indian child due to the ICWA. Um, and they offered uh, their services pro bono uh, to these parents who uh, may have been prevented from adopting uh, due to the Indian Child Welfare Act. Uh, since that time, the Goldwater Institute, the National Council for Adoption, and other groups have filed over 10 federal lawsuits attempting to have ICWA declared unconstitutional. And for the most part, all of them failed. Um, however, they did find a sympathetic ear in Judge Reed O'Connor in the Federal District Court in Texas in Fort Worth. Um, and that's where this case started initially. And as, as you already stated, the initial plaintiffs were uh, several families, the Brackeens, the Librettis, the Cliffords, and a, and a biological mom who supported the Librettis' adoption, as well as the states of Indiana, Texas, and uh, Louisiana. And uh, in the Supreme Court, I think only Texas is remaining as a state plaintiff. Uh, there were also several tribes involved at the district court and uh, appellate level, and that includes Cherokee Nation, Oneida Nation, Quinault Nation, Morongo Band of Mission Indians, and the Navajo Nation. Now, at the district court level, uh, Judge O'Connor ruled for the plaintiffs on almost every issue. So he found that ICWA violates the anti-commandeering clause. He found that ICWA violates equal protection. He found that Congress did not have authority under the Indian Commerce Clause to pass ICWA. And I think the only issue that he did not find for the plaintiffs was substantive due process. Um, of course, that case was appealed to the Fifth Circuit. Uh, there was a panel and then in banc. Um, after the oral argument, uh, the in banc panel took about 14 months to issue a 325 page decision where six of the 17 judges wrote separately on claims. Uh, that decision is incredibly complex. Um, however, uh, one of the judges, Judge Costa, really pointed out, and, and this goes you know, to, to the heart of the standing uh, issue for equal protection, is that he said that a term for a judicial decision that does nothing more than opine on what the law should be is just that, an advisory opinion. And, and that is what this is. And, and he said that because since this was filed in federal court, um, federal courts can't impose upon state courts this decision. So the fact that the Fifth Circuit did declare this to be unconstitutional does not uh, necessarily mean that the state courts would find it unconstitutional. Now, of course, now we are at the Supreme Court, uh, it, it is a different level, um, but that's an issue you know, that was raised uh, early on, whether the decision that came out of Justice Reed O'Connor's court or the Fifth Circuit uh, would be binding on any of the state courts. Um, now, as Professor Wheel uh, said, Quite, quite well, there are 
several main issues before the court. Uh, I think she addressed whether Congress had authority to enact ICWA. Um, and, and I agree that if the court were to find that Congress did not have the authority to enact ICWA, it would be a real swipe to uh, the long line of cases that have recognized congressional broad plenary power to legislate for Indians. And I think at the oral argument, um, the plaintiffs had a hard time distinguishing that long line of cases uh, because there are so many and uh, because uh, Congress has legislated for Indians on a broad array of issues and because the power comes not just from the Indian Commerce Clause but from the powers of war, peace, uh, and the treaties. And Congress has long enacted statutes uh, to protect Indians as well. Uh, the Major Crimes Act is an example, the Violence Against Women Act. Um, so why could they not pass uh, a statute to protect uh, children? Uh, another issue that is was raised by the plaintiff is whether or not uh, domestic relations are the exclusive province of the states. Um, and I think both the United States and, and the intervening tribes did a good job of countering um, countering those arguments, uh, Congress has, in fact, uh, addressed domestic matters in uh, federal legislation. The Service Member Civil Relief Act is one of those, um, as well as spending clause powers for child support, for foster care, and for adoption. Uh, the second major issue that is before the Supreme Court is whether ICWA violates the anti-commandeering principle under the 10th Amendment. Um, and I will I will save additional detail on this argument for the professors, but um, I will note this, that uh, the, the argument is that this is preemption. It's not commandeering. Um, and that ICWA applies equally to both private and state actors. And, and one thing that I find uh, really interesting, at least in the Fifth Circuit, was that only three states had challenged ICWA's constitutionality. And only 1% of federally recognized tribes and 4% of the American Indian and Alaska Native population are located in those three states. So the states that were complaining that ICWA was unconstitutional and commandeered resources had a really small population of uh, American Indians or Alaska Natives. In contrast, 26 states and the District of Columbia filed amicus briefs uh, asking the Fifth Circuit to uphold ICWA. And those states have 94% of federally recognized tribes and 69% of American Indian and Alaska Native populations. Um, so the states that really are um, applying ICWA in these proceedings are saying that it is not common during resources and we support it. Um, and the final point I wanted to make before turning it over to Professor Romer with respect to equal protection is, is one issue, and I think Professor Wheel raised this as well, um, has to do with the standing of plaintiffs uh, in regards to equal protection. And uh, one of the arguments is, is that the individual plaintiffs cannot show redressability here. Um, they cannot show that there was an injury that would be redressable by a favorable uh, federal decision. Uh, and one of their arguments is that they argue if the federal courts declare ICWA constitutional, then maybe the state courts will. But that doesn't bind the parties. And also standing needs to be considered at the time of the commencement of this case. Um, as Judge Costa said, uh, the decision is, is simply an advisory opinion. In addition, I don't think any of the plaintiffs can show an injury in fact. Um, all of the state court cases involving the children in this case have ended. Uh, the Brackeens adopted the child. Uh, at the time of the amended complaint, they had already adopted the child. So one may argue that they never had standing. Um, there's a second child that's involved in the case, but at the time of the complaint, that child had not even been born. Um, in addition, the Librettis had already adopted their child as well, um, and the Clifford's case was also resolved. Um, and then finally, Texas does not have any standing with respect to equal protection because they can't show an invasion of a legally protected interest. Um, the word person does not encompass states, and uh, Texas cannot assert the equal protection rights of a third party. So I think there's a real question with respect uh, to standing and redressability and injury in fact here. And then I will turn it over uh, to my colleague, uh, Professor Romer, to discuss, discuss the political distinction of the Indian classification. <laughs> 
Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I got ahead of myself, so thank you for keeping us on track. Um, I, you know, that is a point that I think gets lost so much. Um, all of the people who are alleging that ICWA is discriminating against them actually won at every level, right? Um, so then to come and turn around and say, let's dismantle this law that is discriminating against people when it has never discriminated against us and we actually got everything we want, um, over the objections of blood relatives is kind of astounding. All right, so now I will turn it over to you, Neosha, um, to help us understand this distinction between um, these race, supposed race-based classifications and what the response to that is. Sure, so one of the arguments here is that um, because um, ancestry is involved, uh, well, let me actually just back up. Um, in order to be an Indian child under uh, the Indian Child Welfare Act, uh, the child either has to be an enrolled member of an Indian tribe, so one of the 574 federally recognized tribes, or the child has to be the biological child of a tribal member who is enrolled and also eligible for enrollment. Um, so it creates this citizenship piece, meaning that you have to be um, a member eligible to become a member um, in a tribe in order to become a, a, a Indian child or be considered an Indian child under the act. Um, otherwise, um, if you're not a member, you can't be a member, then that person, that child does not qualify as an Indian child under the act. The reason that exists is because for so long, um, and especially since the 1974 Morton versus Mancary case, um, Indian, in this sense, has been considered a political status, meaning that because I am a citizen, um, or rather I shouldn't, um, let me back up and not use first person language here, but um, if a person is a citizen of a tribe, that entitles them to uh, everything that comes with being a citizen of that tribe. That's the political piece. So when we're saying an Indian child here, we're talking about someone who has a political status. But the argument in terms of equal protection um, looks at how um, someone can become a tribal member. And a couple of important points on this. Um, first off, um, the petitioners point to the fact that um, enrollment is based on ancestry, um, which is true in most cases, um, actually all cases, um, that enrollment is based on ancestry. But there's a major red flag on this. Um, for at least one reason, which is that that is a policy that the federal government imposed on Indian tribes um, in terms of who could be members and what protections would be afforded to members. Um, an analogy that I use often is that most people in America are familiar with the one drop rule for African Americans, meaning that if you're one, if you have one drop of African American blood, you're African American, and that's because that suited the purposes for slavery. Whereas for American Indians, um, the government had a different policy in mind, which, as I mentioned before, was we need to assimilate, we need to get rid of Indians, we need to get rid of Indian tribes. So it worked opposite in which the U.S. government um, implemented or introduced to tribes this idea of the blood quantum. Um, so if someone wasn't at least one quarter blood Indian, they weren't considered Indian um, for, for these purposes. So the problem with this then becomes um, who is Indian um, and sort of what the role the federal government has historically played in that classification. Um, because today, um, each tribe, each of the 574 uh, tribes gets to determine their own membership. They all have their own membership rules, membership office. Uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs is still in charge of issuing what are called certificate um, uh, certificate of Indian blood that tells someone how how much Indian they are. Um, so it, it's all tied back to the, these colonial practices. But then that itself is a problem because uh, it now quantifies how much Indian someone is and how that gets used. So, for example. In the last U.S. Supreme Court case um, involving an Indian child, adoptive couple versus baby girl, the very first sentence of the case says that baby girl is three slash two five six or 1.2% Indian. So first off, that's not how her tribe um, 
describes her, according to the Cherokee Nation, she is a member, she is a citizen, a full citizen of the Cherokee Nation. Um, so on one hand, she has this political status, but because of how, um, as non-Indians, we view race, um, this has been taken to equate to the child is barely, in quotation marks, Indian, um, and used against um, Indian peoples. But to the larger question here in terms of political status versus race, um, all of Indian law is based on this concept, this longstanding principle that American Indian is a political status because of the membership, because of that relationship that Americans hold or American Indians hold with their tribe. Um, to back up and call that um, race-based is, is a danger. It is a threat to all of Indian law. Um, it also provides some other interesting problems, especially as I mentioned in terms of where that idea even comes from and it's from colonialism. And second, um, just creating, um, I mean, as a scholar, it's pretty clear for me to see that this whole equal protection argument is so that the, the act fails um, because we know what the race-based claims are and, and how the US Supreme Court sees those um, in terms of, will this ever be able to meet strict scrutiny if it's race-based? Um, so I'll, I'll, I will kind of leave it there, but I, I think I've, I've answered the question and I don't want to get too far in the weeds because I know we have other questions, but that's the major distinction um, because, it, and I just will also highlight, I get a lot of questions about how can tribes even participate? How is that possible? And again, it's that political status piece. Thank you so much. Um, it's really helpful to understand. Um, Kim, you sort of alluded to this uh, when you first spoke that this is not simply about children, right? This case, the, the implications of this case have so much broader implicate the implications of this case are so much broader than you know what happens to these kids we know these kids are already adopted they're in these homes and even for children long term right this is we're talking about major expansions um a federal of of constitutional doctrines and and really you know, I, I I know that during the argo, uh, oral argument, some of the justices said, well, if we go this way, we're going to be really busy for a really long time. Can you explain to us what some of these other implications are if ICWA is found to be unconstitutional? Yeah, so it's, so it's important to think of it in the context, I think, of what's happening in other cases under this particular United States Supreme Court, right? So if you think of government power in basically, in here, I guess you have um, five, four, I'd say five or six buckets. You've got the federal government, power of Congress, power of the judiciary, and the power of the president. Then you've got state power, and then you've got tribal power. And then I would add, you've got voting, individual power, the power in the people. Um, what this is, what's happening, I think, in this case, really dramatically, when you have a statute that's been been you know in place for decades and you've got 200 years 200 years of precedent that treats tribes as political classifications that is as i said earlier like sovereign sovereigns and even justice barrett said the problem with or she alluded to the problem with treating uh, tribal status or indian status as as race is that she says it treats the tribes as fungible as if it's all one big monolith when actually they're individual sovereigns. Um, so, so the the sort of the the audacity of going after something this well established, two hundred years of precedent that's been untouched. Justice Gorsuch saying there's never been a case reversed as exceeding Congress's Indian Commerce Clause power. Um, th that 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 sort of aggressive approach to litigation to make it to the Supreme Court to overcome the hurdles to justiciability and standings, the standing doctrine, the idea that you've got to have a real injury. The idea behind standing is so that people don't just sail into court and have the courts decide political issues. You know, that that you've got to say, I've got an injury, I've got a broken arm, I've got something that I need to have remedied so I can be made whole. If you don't can't show that you're not allowed to go to the courts, you've got to go to the ballot box and to your elected leaders because courts, federal courts in particular, are not accountable at the ballot box. They're appointed. They are they serve for life. Federal judges cannot be fired. You cannot vote them out of office. 
So the standing problem, kind of leapfrogging over those problems, which I think the court's going to do, it's doing it in other cases as well, just kind of giving lip service to standing and going right for the jugular of these really core political issues that it could easily say, listen, we're going to wait till we have a proper plaintiff. We want to stay out of that and leave it for the political branches. So sort of ignoring those threshold questions of injury and taking these cases, that enhances the power of the judicial branch that is not elected and that we the people cannot hold accountable through the electoral process. So that diminishes the power of the people. Then you've got a statute passed by Congress under its Commerce Clause power. It's in the same part of the Constitution that has the broader Commerce Clause power um, that is a little trickier and it's a little more limited, but that Commerce Clause power gives Congress the power to enact national criminal laws for, for the federal government. It gives Congress the power um, to enact civil rights legislation. I mean, a lot of commerce, Congress's power comes from the Commerce Clause. And then I, I just can't help but say you've got a case like Dobbs that happened last year with abortion rights, where um, where again the Supreme Court jumped really kind of jumped the gun on threshold issues of um, uh, you know in that case it took uh, basically didn't stay the statute in Texas. Um, when it was unconstitutional under a row because it stopped abortions at six months. It let that go into effect, ignoring its own precedent. It ignored 50 years of precedent. So here, the idea that it's going to now go and ignore 200 years of precedent um, is a problem. And of course, that case gave a lot of this police power over, I mean, call it police power, the state's prerogative in that case over women's bodies, um, childbearing people's bodies, gave that to the states. Here we have potentially taking power from the federal government, from the United States Congress, and giving it to states and taking it from, from Indian tribes and giving it to states. So what we're seeing is a we're seeing is a reshifting of the players on the stage. If this is a Shakespeare play and you've got the king and the queen and the knaves and the, you know, who has the power of the of the of the people. Um, and we're seeing it enhanced in the courts that are unaccountable, enhanced in the states, and diminished in, at the federal level. And just to be clear, um, for non-lawyers, I know there's some on the on the probably on on the chat. I know there are because I I can um, see some people that that I know through Instagram and also some students. Um, the whole point of the Constitution is to set a red line. That is regardless of other interests, there are certain places you just can't go government. You can't, and so the theory is here, you cannot intrude on what's left of it, tribal sovereignty, right? That That's just a red line and that's established. Congress gets to make those determinations. And there was, you know, the treaty power only enhances it, but their argument here is, listen, um, the treaty power, the, the commerce power, all that is only around commerce. Kids are not commerce. Um, and you know, I should just say Justice uh, Kavanaugh, um, you know, we have Gorsuch, Barrett, uh, Kagan, and um, certainly Sotomayor probably, you know, for on the side of the tribes and the federal government. Um, but Justice Kavanaugh said, listen, I have a problem here because um, we've got this balancing issue. We've got on the one hand, we have tribal sovereignty, and the other hand, we have, you cannot make distinctions on the basis of race or ancestry. He kind of looped those together. And that's the same sort of equipoise, golly gee, I don't know what to do, what he did with, with Dobbs, where he said, listen, we've got this right, but we also have states' rights. So what do you do? The protection of uh, people's reproductive rights, but then you've got this federalism. So we're just going to give it back to the states and send it to the ballot box. That's really, you know, it's hard to really overstate in this moment how how in 10 years from now, I think we could be having a very different conversation about the scope of the Constitution's protections and the relative powers of the various entities, including human beings as voters, that hold authority in, in the American political system. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, that's horrifying. And bringing us back to Dobbs also is horrifying. Um, Neosha. Yeah, so um, there was uh, something I just wanted to highlight as well. Um, something that kind of flew under the term or under the radar last term is um, a case that uh, the Supreme Court uh, delivered its opinion in about seven days after Dobbs, which is called Oklahoma versus Castro Huerta. Um, it's a pretty big Indian law case. 
Um, I can't say that we have a lot of consensus on what that opinion means or what it stands for, um, but something I'd like to highlight, um, because uh, some of the comments um, just made me think of this in terms of, you know, where, where might we be? Um, Castro Huerta uses some pretty scary language with regards to states' rights in this particular field of Indian law. While the case is pretty specific because it's responding to a 2020 case called McGirt versus Oklahoma, or not responding directly to, but it's um, responding to the fact that after McGirt versus Oklahoma, we now know that 47% of the state of Oklahoma is Indian country, meaning it's Indian land, meaning Indian law um, principles govern um, a lot of uh, criminal, it's about criminal jurisdiction. Um, but not to get too in the weeds of that, in writing its opinion in Castro Huerta, the Supreme Court uses some really scary language um, about states' rights and the rights that states have. And, you know, tribes have always been a part of states. And, you know, there's a there's about two to three sentences, a chunk of text um, that Justice uh, Kavanaugh writes and just cites it with the Tenth Amendment. That is very contrary to our principles of, of Indian law, the 200 years of Indian law um, that we have. Um, that's why it's so scary. It's scary that Holland versus Barkeen is also, um, we're hearing the same, you know, sort of challenge in terms of commandeering um, and states rights come up in Holland versus Barkeen. Um, as a scholar, I think that we're probably going to see, or we have a potential to see Holland versus Barkeen be a referendum, um, or at least help us understand what the court was actually saying in Castro Huerta. Um, but that is all to say, um, you know, that I think we're, we we could be having different conversations, and I really hope we're not, but um, the conversations could change depending on where the court goes and its willingness um, to either stick with precedent and how we understand Indian law or how we, um, or where we go from here. Thank you. You know, um, Kim's mention of Dobbs also made me think, you know, when Dobbs came out, our a lot of people's instinct was to be like, what next, what next, what next, what next? And the sky is falling. And it is so important to think about what the implications are in the future. But we also don't lose want to lose sight of what this case means, especially for uh, Native people and their tribes. So if I want to turn to you for a second to talk about what will overturning ICWA mean for Native people, for your clients, for the tribes that you represent? That is a tough question. Um, I will say first and foremost, I think tribes are always going to protect their children. Um, I have seen that in the work that I do, and I think tribes are going to continue to show up and to protect their children and to come to court, whether we have equal or not. Tribes have always done that for hundreds of years, and they will continue to do that. Um, if ICWA is declared unconstitutional, it certainly puts tribes in a difficult position of not having those minimum federal standards, but I still think um, tribes can continue to assert jurisdiction, can continue to try and transfer cases, can continue to try to intervene under the civil rules in state court proceedings. Um, there is also at least 10 states that have their own state Indian Child Welfare Act laws and other states that are considering similar laws and over 20 states that have implemented at least some provisions of ICWA in their laws or rules. So I don't think all is lost. Um, I, I think tribes will continue to protect their children to the extent um, that they can and have always done so. Thank you. And uh, Kristen, one of our guests put in our chat that uh, New Mexico is working on their Indian Family Protection Act and really making this political um, status question very clear so as to avoid <laughs> this problem in the future for the families of New Mexico. Um, Kim, I know you wanted to add one more thing, so I'm going to go back to you. Yeah, I just don't want to overstate the federalism issue here, um, in part because let's not forget what happened with New York and the Second Amendment uh, in the Bruin case, where the state tried to regulate the use of firearms, um, handguns outside the home, and the Supreme Court pulled back um, on states' rights in that regard. So, um, 
this really is a very, this is a, a group of individuals who are willing to really exercise their un, unaccountable authority in this moment. So that was just the only point I wanted to make it. We were a little bit buckle our seatbelts and see what happens uh, across the board. There's not really a unifying, consistent, intellectually honest theme um, when it comes to these constitutional questions. Yes, as the uh, strict scrutiny podcast hosts say, no law, just vibes. Um, so, <laughs> Well, Kristen tells me that the New Mexico Indian Family Protection Act passed, so that's great to know. Um, and with our few minutes left, April, I know that you submitted an amicus brief in Brackeen and that you were there at the court for arguments. And I wonder if you could share your impressions um, based on what you heard and saw um, about how you think this is going to go. Sure. Um, so yes, I was there. I stood in the cold for three hours freezing to get in to see the oral argument. Many people did not, uh, unfortunately. So I felt very, very lucky to be there. Um, you know, there were times where, you know, tribal advocates and supporters of ICWA were encouraged by some of the questioning. I think Justice Gorsuch, um, you know, had a command of uh, the history of plenary power in the Indian Commerce Clause, and he certainly uh, grilled the plaintiffs on those issues, um, and it felt encouraged, uh, as well as Justice Brown Jackson. She came incredibly prepared and asked uh, some really good questions um, with respect to the issue of sovereignty and self-government. You know, she asked the plaintiffs, you know, what could be more central to self-government or sovereignty than than tribes being able to determine their citizenship? And, and I agree, you know, what could be more central to self-government than the continued existence of tribes? And by taking their children, uh, you attempt to take their sovereignty and tribes themselves. Um, so while I, I was very encouraged by those questions, uh, I was discouraged by some of the questions from the other justices. And, uh, you know, with the Dobbs case and with uh, uh, Castro Huerta, um, you know, and the fact that this came all the way to the Supreme Court on what essentially was a facial challenge. There is no factual record that was developed. And in fact, many of the points made in the plaintiff's briefs are just incorrect. Um, you know, that's discouraging. And so uh, I think as tribal advocates, we remain hopeful. Uh, I think, you know, if I had to guess who we could count on our side, I, I would hope that would be uh, Justice Kagan, Sotomayor, uh, Justice Gorsuch, Justice Brown Jackson, um, and then it's anyone's guess. And so while we remain hopeful, I think uh, we're also, you know, planning and trying to put things in place in the event uh, that the court does declare that ICWA is uh, unconstitutional. I wanted to say one final point, and that's uh, that this is the third ICWA case to get to the Supreme Court, but the only case that is a dependency matter. The vast majority of ICWA cases are child welfare and dependency. And ICWA has been called the gold standard by child welfare uh, you know, experts all across the country because it's what's best for kids. It's what's best for children. And to have that declared unconstitutional, I think, uh, is just a disappointment and a shame. Yeah, as someone who works in child welfare, uh, I agree. That is the gold standard. What could be better than ensuring that children remain with their parents first? And if not, with their kin or with their community um, and to see the Supreme Court see that is not in their best interest would truly be devastating uh, in so many ways. Um, I want to thank you all. This was such an amazing panel. I learned so much um, and I want to thank our guests for hanging with us and for your great questions, which we tried to answer throughout. If we didn't get to you, feel free to reach out to us um, and we will try to answer your, your questions. And thank you for all the information uh, the guests provided too. Thanks for your side chats. We appreciate it. Thanks so much and have a great night.